天的白维武教授。好，那我们请每一队的队长先介绍一下你们的队友跟啊队员。那么从 report 开始好吗？开始我们今天的第一场呃第一场 busy fight 好，那我们先请那个 opponent 提出问题，计时一分钟。所以第一第一个 reject 好，那再你就提出第二个。OK， 我不能签，请退。那所以第一个 reject。reject。要写上去。当他们 reject 的时候，提出的时候要写在上面，然后 reject 就 OK。OK， 那那你继续。
第三个。陈安杰，等一下，那是什么？不行，这样时间会重新计时，要回去，回去上上面那个，对，对，继续。是另外一位张，张改成张，第二个是张。张张张一俊，最下面最下面。好，大家麻烦中文的这些中文，谢谢。那你播的确定是九十九？
So problems segment of mention that a spherical hole drops onto the hard surface will never be bound to the this height, even if it has an inertial speed. A capsule shaped object, uh, for example like tic tac uh, on the other hand may go exit to the inertial height. So we are trying to focus to this, investigate this phenomenon. So we mainly focus on the three question. Why does the capsule exceed this inertial height? Uh, what relevant parameter affects the capsule's big height? And what are the ideal conditions for the capsule to exceed its initial height? So I'll investigate the phenomenon first, then I'll move on to our theoretical model. Then I'll talk about the experimentation and the discussion, and I'll conclude this, uh, this presentation. So as you can see, uh, this strip of gold never go exceed to its initial height. However, uh, when you look at the tech, which is a uh, scriptal shape, it sometimes goes to the initial height, which is at this point. So, first we define the capsule shape. We define the capsule that, uh, capsule defined as there's a cylindrical model, and there's two semi-sphere shape covering the top and bottom of the cylindrical surfaces. And we define that R is the radius of the semi-sphere, and then L is the uh, height for the cylinder. So to compare with the sphere and the capsule, first, a uh, sphere, <coughs> sphere which is symmetrical uh, cannot exceed this initial height. Uh, so we conclude that the spinning does not affect the height with the uh, spherical balls of the ball. However, in the capsule shape, which is a symmetrical shape, uh, it can exceed, exceed the initial height. So this meaning that it's, the spinning does impact to go exceed the initial height. So this is what we define as the <coughs> variable. So we define it's not as an initial height and impact velocity as bi1 and then the first height as h1 and keep going on. So first one, uh, we use the same height but we, we use the same height and we also use the same angular velocity but when, as you can see, uh, although it dropped in the same height, the uh, rebounding is different. This indicates that uh, the phenomenon is sensitive to the initial condition, which is the contact point. And the second point, uh, we find the threshold angular velocity that of 200 meters per second is the one that can go mixed with the initial height. And we also investigate that uh, only the first bound can exceed this initial height. <coughs> so this is the graph as the x position and the in respect to the time for the bounds. Uh, as you can see, r square is closer to the one. There is a strong correlation between the uh, x position propagating to four and then the time. So we conclude that uh, the constant for the x position is the constant. So we link that to that there is a low contact time. So we <coughs> uh, so there is a low contact time, and although there is a friction, but it's they was able to calculate it because we have low contact time. So there's a few assumptions, assumptions that we did it before the experiment. First, as you can see this graph, uh, we assume that the x component velocity does not change. And also we assume that the capsule has a rigid body, which means there's no deformation. And also we assume the capsule shape that it is uh, contained with the cylindrical shape with the two semi-sphere on the top and bottom. And we also assume that there's no air resistance, and we also assume that the capsule is uniform mass density. So in ideal proof, in ideal condition, uh, initial mechanical energy for the initial height is the sum of the potential height from the kinetic, uh, rotational kinetic energy. And when it's first impact in the first impact point, it will be only uh, kinetic energy for translation and rotational, but no uh, no potential energy. So we can generalize the like generalize the previous bounce and the bounce after as this form in ideal situation. However, however, since uh, in realistically there's of course energy loss. So we use the coefficient of the restitution to uh, introduce the energy loss. Uh, the coefficient of the restitution is defined by the velocity change after uh, divided by the velocity change before. So when you square this part, it's going to be the ratio of the 
energy loss energy ratio. So it's going to be the energy how how many energy loss due to the impact. So we define the depth factor as the coefficient of the restitution square. Then every bonds, uh, they lost this amount of the energy loss. So if it keep going, as what we generalized the mechanical energy equation, it keep losing the energy. So we can find the relationship for the previous bonds and the after bonds as mv and equal to e part of e and mechanical energy bond. So uh, to explain this diagram that we model. This perpendicular line is the normal uh, to the surface, and then L, we define L as the center of the mass to the contact points. And then um, we define E as the angle between the normal and the angular velocity that propagates in this way. So uh, we know that angular velocity is velocity over distance from the center to the impact point. So the velocity that propagating the normal direction is 3IN. So this velocity, which is this one, divided by L. So we find the angular velocity, which, in, which is rotating this way, on clockwise. But every bounce, there's some energy loss. So we contain E squared over here. And then, um, we use the initial mechanical energy is equal to the final uh, mechanical energy when it impact. So we define velocity as 2GH n minus 1, which is the previous height. And then, uh, and then for velocity that going propagating to the normal direction, we define as uh, we define this because the as same as this logic. So it is all mechanical energy is same to the final, final mechanical energy. So this is the final mechanical energy, and this is the kinetic kinetic um, rotational energy. So we can find velocity that propagating uh, forward to with this equation. So when we find height that it after the rebounding, it's gonna be we square over 2g, and we plug this number into 3m to find the high equation. So this is our setup. Uh, we film with the 240 fps global camera, and then uh, we flip the we flip the cap, uh, tip cap with the hand. But to make the height consistent, we put one arm to the top of the boom, and then we only use the other hand to flip it. And we to make ensure that the, we only take the 2D motion, we only use the uh, rebounding tic tac that only follow this uh, 2D line. And then to analyze the method, we use the tracker to uh, analyze the <coughs> position and angle. So uh, we track each end of the capsule here first, and then after that we find the other side of the capsule tip, and then we find the position and the angle from here. So firstly, we try to find the coefficient of the restitution. Uh, after we find the experiment that allow that coefficient of the restitution is 0 0.65, then we move on to the test three different independence variable, which is initial height, contact angle, and then angular velocity. After that, we try a uh, few exper three experiments to uh, test the peak height with initial height, angular velocity, and contact angle, which is from this independent variables. So we did 10 trial for each height with spin and low spin. And then we find the ratio for the coefficient of the restitution. And then we define that the benefit factor is the uh, coefficient of the restitution square. So we find that it's 0 0.65 for that. So every bounce, uh, the energy loss will be the previous mechanical energy total multiplied by this number. So here's the first graph that I mentioned. So this is the initial height uh, respect to the peak height. 
So this indicates that uh, the higher height will lend to the more potential energy. So there will be higher rebound height. And uh, this is the relation between the peak height and the contact angle. So greater V, which I defined before, will be led to the higher peak height. So more of the velocity in the normal direction contribute to the capsule speed. And lastly, uh, we use the peak height and the initial angular velocity graph. This is showing that initial angular velocity of square is that uh, proportional to the peak height, and also we uh, conclude the, draw the conclusion that the higher angular velocity uh, will lead to the more kinetic energy, therefore it led to the peak height. So we uh, define the capsule shape and then rotational energy calculation in the idle condition, but we recognize that there is energy loss. So we try to use these three independent variable to test the height. Thank you. Okay, question of opponent. Okay, so thanks. So thanks for the important report. And as a short question, first, do you consider center of mass velocity when calculating for a rate, the coefficient of restitution? Can you remove Can you do you consider the center of mass velocity when calculating for the for the COR? Yes. You 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 consider it? Consider it? Yeah. The the center of mass velocity. Yeah. Yes? Okay. And next question is how do you how do you uh, try to fix the 2D vs 3D motion? Because tracker only can track 2D motions. But actually, the rebound is 3D motion. How do, how do you track it? Yes, so that's the reason why I draw. I showed a picture that I drew a red 2D line. So we only use the data, the capsule rebound, that following that direction, this one. OK, OK, yeah. OK, so next, do you, in a theory, do you estimate the change of more or frequent or friction force when impact when the capsule impacting on the surface. Do do you estimate the change of normal force or friction force, or just consider it is a constant? Can you repeat the Do you estimate the change of normal force or friction force when the capsule impacting on the on the hard surface? Do you estimate the change of it or consider it a constant? Constant. Constant. Okay. Okay. And next question is. What situation only calls if Vx for linear fitness it has the same velocity? What situation calls it? Uh, as you showed it, as I showed it in the initial height, so one that mentioned the correlation, strong correlation, you assume that there's a, a linear relationship between the x of uh, x component. So every every time you throw you throw the capsule will be like this? Yes, so I yeah, that's the reason I say there's a uh, okay. velocity to the x component is constant. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so this is all my show question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. of 103 minutes. Thank you. 
你要这样去啊，你这样放在心。我们就我们等他开了再去。And for the setup, they use a textbook for for measure for different heights, and they use high speed camera to track the motion of the capsule, and use a tracker to analyze its motion, and let's use hand to throw it. And as they move on to the experimental data, like for example, they give us an angular velocity at the rebounding height, and told us that the Vx is linear fitting. And in the conclusion, they told us that rotational energy and potential energy. And also, kinetic energy will have the will cause for the higher heights of the rebound of the capsule. So these the strings and the strings and pros and cons of the robust report. First, they give us a clear explanation of their observation video and and their also the setup. However, they they didn't they didn't told us how to they didn't fix their theory theory model into into their comparison data because we think the most important. Thing in this in this、uh, topic is to tell us what situations cause the higher rebound. Not every situation will cause it. So they didn't tell us. And also, they need to discuss more on experimental data and the comparison data of the results. And this on Q and A, I ask I ask is if they consider center of mass velocity, and they answer yes. And I will I will continue to discuss this later. And I ask to how to try it. I, I asked how to solve 2D vs 3D motion problem, and the answer our reporter gave us they they have a 2D line. However, in our、uh, in our opponent's view, we think that the capsule is actually 
uh, it actually a three D motion, no matter how you track it. And so, and last question is, I ask how do how do you measure? Do you estimate the change out of the normal force on the friction for or the friction force when impacting? And the reporter answer, they we consider they they as a constant because uh, and the reason why I ask it is because when the capsule impact on the hard surface, the normal force and the friction force is actually not a constant. And I will have a discussion for the board for some time. Okay, so next we can move on to the discussion part. Okay. Okay, so first I want to I want to uh, I want to define the C O R again. So so let's let's move to so. So, so you define so how so you define the, your your C O R as the uh, the impacting velocity and the outcome velocity, right? So, so you 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 be like this, like this, right? V two is the impacting velocity. Yes. So, um, so do you so I ask you for the center uh, for the center of mass velocity because and you answer no. So, so you think this V two is center of mass velocity. <coughs> If you define this as yes, you define this as central. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in our opponent's view, because when your capsule impact on the hot surface, you you in your theory you you estimate this, you you, uh, you calculate for this, this for this angle, right? You calculate it. No, I calculate on um, um, I calculate angles T T. So it's this. So it's like here. Yeah. Okay. So I think you need to be drawn the diagram. It's not always like that. Yeah. Like this. Yeah. 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 This, this tip is here. Yeah. So it depends. Okay. So the reason I asked you for the oh, so the reason I asked you for the impact for the center of mass velocity because the capsule is actually spinning when throwing down, right? Yes. It's, it's uh, no matter is is counterclockwise and uh, maybe it's it's counterclockwise and you have omega and however in so. So okay, another short question is uh, so you define the the C O R in this point? Yes. Yeah, you, you in this point. Okay, so for the for the impacting point, you only you only consider the incoming velocity, right? Yes. And you define this as center of mass. However, when the when the capsule starting to raise and you starting to rotate, it will have another another velocity will be written as R times omega one. Yes. So, uh, so I, I can draw another another uh, Wait, another. So, yes. So, what are you trying to say about this? Uh, uh, is you more? Oh, uh, yeah. I, I will. I will. It's, uh, I, I, my definition is a small small difference. Okay. 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 okay so, so my definition of your R is like here. When when the, because uh, when the impacting point is actually the velocity is equal to the yes. surface. Yes. It's related is zero. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so this is zero. However, for for the center of mass velocity, it's actually uh, if we assume this is the B point. So the B A is actually the B B plus R plus R omega, and this R is the radius of the ball. Yes. Yeah. So so actually your B B is B A minus R omega. Yeah. So yes. So but you you didn't you only say this only B A. Not consider our omega. Yes. So I'll, I want to clarify. Okay. So first, the way that we the way that we find velocity is yes. We trying to find this capsule and let's say this the next bounce. Yes. And we find the center of the mass change yes. and then we divide by the frame. Okay. So first, first the the actual the actually uh the fact of the rebound, the, the cancel rebound is actually the impacting point. Yeah. Okay, so, so I think you need to measure this velocity, not this velocity. So you measure this velocity. Yes. The, the, this actually impacting point is on, is on the hot surface, not the center. So you need to consider, I think you need to also consider R omega in order to, in order to um, maybe prove your data to your experiment. Yes, I want to go over this because okay. You are only you meaning you think about the friction as well. Uh, no friction. No friction. Yes, it's um, it's a relative velocity from to the to the hard, to the surface. Then I want to ask what is still causing this angular velocity this way? Is it are you saying oh, that? Oh, so what caused the angular to to rebound in yeah. my view? Yeah. Okay, so in my view, when the when the uh, I mean, I mean, here, so when the capsule impact on the surface at least. It will actually, if this is an impacting point, it will actually have two force. 
two force. Two force. Uh, normal force and a friction force. Yes. Right. So, so normal force and friction force, friction force maybe here or here will cause the center of mass uh, torque. Yes. I want to go over this. Yes. So you said that we, you said that we using the static friction force. Uh, yeah. Yes. And you also that you said that I constant, right? Uh, you you said that yeah, you you, you yeah. estimated. So I want to go over this one. Okay. Because we went, right? As I saw the, do you remember the R square coil 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 reason one? Like yes. Yes. Graph? Yeah. Yeah. So right. from that point we we said that there's almost uh, less contact time, yes. right? So that meaning that we consider that there's a friction, but it's, it's not enough to impact to the... Okay. To the so, so, so you consider a small impact, and so the friction force will remain constant. No. So, oh, it's constant, but it's almost negligible, because it has short contact time, so it, the, the friction makes the capsule not slipping, it makes yes. it bounce off, yes. but it's negligible amount to... It's insignificant in, in to analyze the mechanism. So, and how about the normal force? The normal force? Yes, I do. So that's the reason. So you change the normal. So do you estimate the rate change on the normal force when impacting? Because actually, the the capsule at the moment, at the moment, maybe he will have a, a small contact, and at that moment, it will have a bigger impact. So the normal force is actually the difference between the time. What do you mean about the area of the contact point? Like yeah, yeah, the contact point will change. You change. Yes. Or so, so you assume for a small impact time. But your, what are you talking about the bigger impact? A bigger, bigger contact bigger. and small contact? Uh, are you meaning about the area or uh, the time? Uh, no, I, I just mean that uh, it, uh, uh, the lower force will change with the time when, when you pass it. Okay, and then of course it will be changing the time. Yes, it will change how with the, the time. How does the time or time get okay. Accepted. So yeah. so so we know that the, when the capsule fall on the, the surface and the uh, the momentum will actually change, right? I will go with the point because we say there's no contact time. Okay, you're so, saying that it okay, so, almost negative. So you just assume yeah. it as a low contact. Time. Yes. Okay. Okay. So next, I want to move on. Is okay. We can we can come. Okay. 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 So next, I want to move on. Is the uh, experiment. Okay, so do you have a comparison between the energy and the, yeah, your, uh, your, your ideal, ideal model in your experimental data? Can you show me? Yes. Yes? Okay. Let's say the magnetic energy is conserved. Yes. This is the initial magnetic energy. So theoretically, it should be same. Uh, it should be same as this point. But as, yes. you, as yes. you can see, that it's decreasing. So yes. there's energy loss. Okay. So it's actually an energy loss. Yes. So do you? So can you show me the, the graph you plot? It's or for. Well, can you show me the slide number? Uh, I I didn't see that in your presentation. It's a. Um, not not this. It's a total energy, total energy. Total energy. You calculate this. You uh, no, uh, the the experimental data. Oh. And for the total for the total energy, you calculate. Uh, no, no, experimental data. Yeah, okay. You, yeah, yeah it's total number three. Uh, you, I, I think you didn't show it in your presentation. Yeah. Uh, so no, so so you know, the so the energy will actually decrease. Yes. Okay. So, so I want to go over that point because oh. I didn't say that mechanical energy is conserved, but the total energy is conserved. And you yeah, can see energy. that mechanical energy is decreasing, which means it transferred to the, the other wait, energy. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Part, the, you say the total energy be conserved? Total energy in the system is conserved. But it impacts on the surface. Yeah, so there's energy loss, which go to the other energies, such as sounds or heat. Yes. So there's energy loss, and as you can see, that is like almost seven times lower. But okay. some of the energy will be go to the potential energy, and that's the reason why that it's go higher than exactly. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Exactly. Right. okay, next question. What situations ca cause the high rebound? What situations? Yes, I want to go over that. Uh, because of time, I didn't have time to talk about it. That's fine. So, this is the threshold peak height, yes. which is around 200 red, red per, per second. Yes. This is the this is the angular velocity that exceeds 
make the person exist the peak height. Also, yeah, I, yes, yeah, I, I, I know. The, the faster angular velocity is e, 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 yes. uh, but my the question is, be what situation causes it? It's like, do we have a limited impacting angle? It, because because uh, in our opponent's view, we believe that the con the impacting angle, like like a theta, I, I have just drawn yeah. here. The impacting angle will affect the the rebounding height. So, yeah. do you have the compacting an angle? Big, big yeah. Oh, yeah. And then big part. So I mentioned that as that all uh, greater p, which is oh. so I define as this is angular velocity. Yes. Sir. This is p. So bigger p will lead to the higher peak height. So the more so velocity to the more direction, which is that yes. way. Yeah. So pardon. So so you just said it will re it will rebound this way. Only rebound in this way. No, I'm saying that it will be the angular velocity direction will be this way because we center of the yeah, 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 so, so, so you so you so you uh, so you assume it will always rebound in this way it's rotating this way but we can guarantee because let's say it's sitting like this way but it can go either, like, either, either way yeah yeah this can be good this way or maybe this way so, so, so you like, you can you only show this yeah. Yeah. Uh, this, 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 yeah. No, okay. we didn't. We didn't show the what's the propagation after that. We just saw that there's a relationship between the angle okay. and the height. Okay, time is up. Okay. So, so for the concluding remarks, our our discussion, we mainly discussed about a COR of the when when the uh, when the capsule impact on the surface because we believe the in my opponent in, in my opponent's view, COR is the main cause. Uh, is a, a major cause of what it can, why, whether it can rebound back. And also, we talked about some experimental data, which which he didn't explain very well in the in the, in the presentation. And he showed us, uh, for example, this this graph, the contact angle and the initial height, and we have a better understanding of the reporters' report, reporters' reports. And last, we talked about the normal force and the friction force change, and the and and the. Reported estimate they didn't change, but however, after discussion in my opponent's view, I just I also I I still think it will change with the time, which the opponents maybe need to con, con, uh, the reporter maybe need to consider in his report. So these all my concluding remarks. Thank you. Okay, next question of the viewer, the reporter and opponent. Three minutes. <laughs> Okay, first of all, my first of all regards to both the opponent team and the reporter team. Okay, first question. Um, for the uh, omega, which is the angular velocity of the capsule itself, is it a negative value or a positive value? Uh, this question is both for the uh, reviewer and the... Uh, so, for us, we define that the counterclockwise is positive and here is negative. Mm -hmm. uh, same, same with the opponent's view, there is actually the, the positive and negative one depending on the clockwise or the counterclockwise of the yes. So, so, yes. Yes. Of yes. so basically you define um, uh, counterclockwise as negative and clockwise as uh, positive or yes. okay. But yes. when we calculate the energy is omega squared so the sign doesn't matter Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. Did you did actually calculate the uh, kinetic, kinetic energy of angular velocity, angular motion which is uh, one half of i omega squared. Yes. You did consider that. Then are you aware of this? No, it, 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 because the uh, the energy really uh, uh, contain the kinetic energy and the rotation energy. It's like we the rotation energy. So you're not aware that they can actually consider the rotational energy in their report. Are you are you aware of this? No, it's 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 reasonable that they consider. What are you? Okay. So, pardon, can you speak your questions? I didn't get your Okay, I can come. Okay, yeah. Sorry, so, so he, you're yes. asking, uh, you consider the angular velocity, and you're saying no. So, uh, did you consider the angle, the energy in which the angular velocity causes, which is this one? Yes, one. Yeah, 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 yes, 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 yes. Okay. Yes. Um. Okay. Second question. You did mention yes. that the friction is, uh. It varies with the angular motion in which the capsule is spinning. You did uh, 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, both, both for, for, for both. Your question is for both. No, no, I, I haven't asked my oh, question oh, yet. Oh, so. oh, so. okay. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Okay. So please, um, is there an actual way instead of like the just flicking the whole the the beam, the capsule? Is there a way to actually regulate the angular velocity that the cap in which the capsule is spinning? 
Is there a way to regulate this? So your question about the apparatus, right? You can, so can you suggest any apparatus that, so you're saying that you want to regulate the angular velocity at the initial, right? So you want some mechanical apparatus that makes you doing the rotation, right? Uh, I'm just asking if you have a, like a, viable solution. Have you ever discussed this? Is this is it like a future thing that you might do? Did you discuss Yes, this? because I did the manually, so yes. my future uh, improvement, then I'll, I'll try to develop the practice. Okay, time's up. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Preparation of a reviewer for two minutes. Okay, I'm stuck. Okay, so again, regards to the opponent team and the reporter team, I am from Team Member Vision and I am the reviewer of the question about the theme, Green Bounding Capsule. So, let's start, shall we? Okay, first of all, the outline of the reporter. We know that they have a clear, clear explanation video. The observation video clearly um, represents the phenomena itself. So, uh, uh, okay. um, the theory, actually, it, it's unaware that the normal force and the friction is not a constant. And that wasn't mentioned anywhere in the theory, so that's a problem. Um, okay. For the setup, the, the, the setup itself, it doesn't, there aren't any really initial flaws in, except for the regulation of the angular motion, but that's really not, uh, it's a slight problem. Um, for the experiment, the experiment is filled with thoughtfulness aided by the completeness of the setup, which you can basically see in their report, and the conclusion. The, the conclusion is pretty nice, it pretty much sums up their report, and um, it basically kind of matches with the theory itself, except for the energy loss. Now. For the pros of the report, very clear structure, as I previously mentioned, detailed mathematical parts seen in the theory, and an overall success regarding the experimental results. But of course, there are some cons. The cons are, the presenter is actually like facing his teammate and not I, just facing us. That's kind of, that's kind of something bad. And some factors are yet to be considered, like I previously mentioned, the normal force and the friction. Yeah. And for the opponent's speech, Confident and fast speaking, that is very good, I like that. Precise questions for the reporter, they cut into the point and actually, and they actually ask Just what really matters. Concise, concise pictures show the questions, yes, that is something. But one of the cons is that the, the, the speaking, I can't really hear it very clearly. And he didn't really concentrate on the report because, as you can see, most of the questions have answers in his report. Um, on your slides, so the yellow and the red was just like all blurred with the words I can't, I couldn't really see. And he used Chinese, what? Yeah, so that, that's like a problem. Okay, so in the clash, um, the opponent first asked, was the center of mass velocity considered during the theory before their answer? Yes. 
Um, from my point of view, the velocity of the center of the mass should be considered. However, the shape of the capsule itself might affect related parameters such as friction or normal force. Um, was the normal force and friction considered during the experiment? No, it was only considered as a constant. That is something that should be considered in the process, since it might create a torque that affects the capsule's motion, including both angular and um, oscillation motion. Okay, so was there comparison between experimental data and the theory? Yes, and after comparison, as the reporter mentioned, there was actually energy loss. So the report, the reviewer thinks that since the energy is not conserved, more deviations of the theory to be dis should be discussed to actually apply to the experiment itself. And um, what situations causes the highest rebound? The report I only mentioned about 200 radian. Um, I think that the reporter should actually provide a precise value, both theoretical and experimental, instead of about. Um, okay, so here are my additional remarks. Um, the reporter should do more analyzation on the deviation and errors of the experiment itself. Second, the opponent should actually concentrate more on the report since many questions already have an answer in the report. Um, third, the opponent should have should not repeat repeat the problem same against his. No, not really a difference, including the key points. Um, when the opponent is using a blackboard, the opponent should block the view above that. I couldn't really see right back there. Um, the opponent should view the experiments in the reporter's aspect instead of that of the opponent's. Okay, which is thanks basically up. mentioned in the rule book. Thank Uncle you. Dean, the mark of reporter. Two minutes. So we provide we give, provide the model of the angular velocity and velocity uh, angular velocity and velocity and the height that actually uh, works and also we didn't say that it's just approximately two hundred radian per second we actually give, provide the equation that we use the data to get that number and also for also for the regulation for the initial height. Uh, since we do manually, we did like 100,000 times to uh, vary the angular velocity, so we trying to get different ranges of the angular velocity. And also we want to go over to the normal force and friction that uh, we viewer mentioned, that I mentioned that because of the low contact time, there's uh, insignificant impact for the friction that led to the exceeding the initial height. And of course, also normal force, since we use the energy equation, so we, I'm not sure why we need to uh, explain with the normal force, we, since we uh, define as the energy conser conservation. And to sum up, the impact angular velocity and initial height is the main cause that uh, the tech led to the exceeding the initial height. Thank you. Okay. Yes, so let's move on to the question of jury. Any questions? That's true, but if we give the initial spin for the sphere, then we can also use the rotational kinetic energy and the translation kinetic energy with the potential energy. And there are also the same amount of initial loss, which will be uh, e squared with system in vector. That's what I believe. Question for the opponent. Yes, I think you mentioned the friction is important. Yes, to consider. Sure. So can you elaborate a little bit more on uh, why you think uh, you know, this is a key okay, so first, issue for this uh, you know, yeah. effect? So first, the, actually what causes the angular velocity to be different is about the torque. The torque will cause the angular acceleration. And, and actually the normal force and the friction force will cause, the, will cause this torque. 
So however, the when the when different when the capsule bounces on the hard sur hard survey, it, it's not only every time the friction force is the same direction. Maybe one, maybe maybe here, maybe when the when the uh, capsule drop on the surface, maybe it will be the left direction or the right direction. So it will vary in the different situations. So I think the friction force is important because it will change direction and also cause the torque. Okay, uh, you know, look at this problem from energy point of view. The friction, of course, you want to minimize, right? Yes. So we can reduce the uh, dissipation. And uh, I, I mean, uh, because uh, it's basically the energy transfer, right? Yes. yes. So you, uh, I thought uh, you might think in a way that the friction uh, may play a role. Um, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe related to shape or something. Yes. Yeah, they can affect the friction. Right. So you want to really minimize the friction dissipation, and so we can really yes. achieve, uh, you know, jumping rebound uh, to a higher level. So can you, uh, you know, uh, do you have any study about, uh, you know, how the friction friction of that uh, yeah, affect, bouncing? Uh, for example, the geometry, uh, how it, it affects the friction. The friction of uh, so uh, so the shape, I, the shape of the oh, object. Oh, the shape of the object will affect the friction. Mm -hmm. So um, so uh, friction so. Um, when so in my view, when the this friction force is not either the maximum static friction force or I, I, I think it will vary in for different impacting angle. So so this uh, this friction force will actually not be the constant. It will depending on the impacting angle. This in my view. Okay, any more questions? I have another question. Uh, let me uh, put your slide back, and I want to uh, review it to have some comments on your slides. It's so go to the slide that you show uh, your data. Okay. If I'm wrong, if I'm understanding your question, uh, you're asking me to elaborate on how this the distribution works. Well, suppose you have a fixed uh, angular velocity, and uh, you measure the peak height many, many times. Mm -hmm. This should be a distribution. So can you tell us what you think the distribution would be like? Oh, yes. Um, for the distribution, so basically we know that energy affects the height, as mentioned in his report. And um, the angular the angular um, kinetic energy is written as 1 over 2 times i times omega squared. So we can actually see that if we don't, if we ignore the, um, the effects of the, uh, normal velocity, which is which the, the velocity that does not involve angular motion, uh, we can see that um, the, the uh, peak height should be directly related to angular velocity squared, so it should look like this, which is a curve, a, a curve in a exponential growth. Uh, professor, I want to add for the distribution ex explanation because, as you can see, most of the dots are usually uh, located to the lower initial height, and it doesn't pass through the threshold, which is of uh, our uh, initial height is 18.988, so this is the threshold that's going up. However, there's uh, not likely, but there's often that going up to the uh, there's some distribution that go up to the threshold and it goes to the exceeding height. And also for the distribution. Sorry, is that yeah. okay? Okay, okay. Well, time's up. Yeah.
Okay, it's the presentation of reporter for 12 minutes. Okay, hello everyone. I'm the reporter from Jinping High School. Today I'm going to talk about our topic, Bean Speed. And this is our outline from the problem statement of the visual video to our theory, experiment, and conclusion. So this is our problem statement. Um, first, let the electric current flow through a coil, and when the cold air flows over the coil, the coil temperature will decrease. What we are going to do is to investigate how the temperature drop depends on the wind speed and what is the accuracy of these methods of measuring the wind speed. So this is our observation video. As the video shows, we can see that the cold air is produced by an electric flow, by an electric fence, and we use the wind tunnel to create an angle flow here. And in our theory, in order to construct the ideal heat transfer, we assume the big H here is the total heat, including the convection to the fluid, conduction to supporters, and the radiation to the surroundings. And there are several assumptions here. So the first is that we assume the radiation loses to the surroundings is small, because in this formula, the standard constant is quite small, so we assume that it won't affect too much. Second is the conduct the wire supporter is also small because we use the alligator clip to support our coil. The third one is the, flu the fluid temperature and the density is a constant. The fourth is the wire temperature uniforms over all the depth of the sensor and affects the fluid velocity impinging normally on the wire and is uniform over its entire length. That is the fluid velocity means the wind speed is small compared to the sonic speed. And this is our experimental setup. In this scanner, we can see several abbreviations we'll use in our, in our formula. For example, the big E represents the fluid velocity, and the resistance of the wire is the big I W here. Also, the trans density N, and also the diameter of the coil, DC here, and the whole length of the coil can represent the whole length of the wire. So now let's move on to the next page. So this is our governing equation, and we use this to represent the derivative of the thermal energy stored in the coil with respect to time equals the draw heating that's provided by the DC power supply minus the heat transfer to the surroundings. So the heat, the heat transfer to the surroundings here by our assumption, and it will only depend on the conduction to the fluid. So this can be represented with the heat transfer coefficient and the, also the surface area of the coil and the destruction of the coil temperature and the ambient and the ambient fluid temperature. And from the law of resistance here, we can see that the resistance of the wire can be, re can be represented again by the resistivity of the coil at a T degree Celsius times the whole length of the wire um, over the cross-section area of the wire. So now this can uh, now we can get four formula here, and by combining these four formula, we can get this extended equation, which still represents the derivative of the thermal energy stored in the coil with respect to time equals the drop heating minus the heat transfer rate to the surroundings. So now let's expand this formula and and cancel several items, and we can got this simpl uh, simplification here. Now, by the King's law, we can see that the relationship between the voltage across the coil and the wind speed. So we want to use, uh, so we want to use this King's law into our formula so that we can represent the relationship between the between the temperature changing rate and the and the wind speed. So in this chart, we can, uh, in this slide, we can see the temperature changing rate formula here. So we can see that the temperature changing rate of the coil only depends on the U here, the big U here means the wind speed, and also H, the heat transfer coefficient here. So we want to discuss the possibilities of this formula. So first, when there is no intercurrent means that when we started to sensing the temperature, we cut off the DC supply, and we can got this formula. And we can see that at last, the the wire, the wire temperature will equal to the ambient temperature. And second, when the draw heating equals the heat transfer rate, it means that our DC supply is still on, and we can get this formula, which, will, which, will, which we will use the next to calculate the critical temperature of the 
of the coil. So now this is our experimental setup. Just like I have just mentioned before, we use the DC supply to supply the coil, the, the current that flows through the coil. And the, and the temperature of the coil was, will be sensing by the thermometer there. And also we use the wind tunnel to create the laminar flow. Then we alter several parameters to observe the phenomenon. The first one is the different fluid velocity, the big E here. And the second one is the, whether the DC supply is on or off. The third one is um, how will the edge, the heat transfer coefficient, small edge, will change depending on which parameters. So this is several background known, uh, background known value for our parameters and will substitute this into our formula. No, so um, first, we have to do a background experiment. Is that we have to find the king's uh, the constant a and b in the king's law, so that we can calculate the more accurate calculate the more accurate data. So, so this is our experimental data, and if we draw a king's law speeding line, we can get the relationship between the between the wind speed and the output voltage here. But they have the power of this, so we just uh, so we just to do some adjust, and we can see that it's it's fits the theoretical line very much. So we can use the constant here. Now, um, let's come to our experiment one. Here we change the wave velocity means the big in the wind speed here, with the DC power supply is off. Now let's see the data, and you can see the power of the exponential item will become um. Um, will become more slow. Uh, will become more small since the wind speed increase, and we can see that the decreasing slope of each curve will will have some relationship between the uh, with the wind speed. It means that the wind speed is bigger, the decreasing slope will be bigger. So that we want to discuss that. So does the temperature decreasing rate really matches our theory? So in this situation, we turn off the DC power supply. So the so the temperature changing rate is the negative heat transfer. Uh, is the negative heat radiating rate here? So let some long value as a constant number, and we can get this. And we can get this formula. This formula we can draw uh, from solving this formula. We can draw a theoretical line, and we can see that the line. Uh, the, the tendency of the line just fit our theory, uh, just fit our experimental data. So now we want to so, so now we want to find the wind speed. So how about the wind speed here? Just like I have mentioned before, we let um, some long value as a constant. Then we can get the pro approximate dependency that when the wind speed increases, the heat transfer coefficient will also increase. So that when the so we can get the conclusion is that. The, when the wind speed increase, we'll get the steeper decreasing rate of the temperature changing rate. So we assume that our theory is applicable. However, we can also see that in our theoretical value and the experimental data, there is still some space within it. So, so in our theory, there must be some less considered term. So for heat conduction here, so why would, why would we choose the heat conduction here? This is because we use the metal alligator clip to support our wire. So we have, so we think that this may be non-negligible for the nylon wire and the metal clips. So how do we measure the heat transfer coefficients? Because I have repeated it again, so we will discuss that later. So let's come to our experiment two and three. So in our experiment two and three, we can see that with the DC power supply is on, we can only get the critical temperature of the um, of each wind speed will be. And this is because in our theory, we can only get the critical temperature. That means the temperature of the wire will finally approach that point. And also we can get this conclusion: the different wind speed will cause the different heat transfer coefficients as well. So now we, we want to find the relationship between the wind, wind speed and the theoretical heat transfer coefficient. So this is our fitting line. So we can, by, by this fitting line, we can predict our heat transfer coefficient, the small edge, by measuring the fluid velocity. That means we can just we can just deduce our fluid velocity by 
by knowing the heat transfer coefficient, and that can be and that can be used in a, and that can be known by our experimental data. So, so for a conclusion, actual parameters that affect the experimental data is the heat transfer coefficient, small h. However, just like the graph has shown, the h will rapidly change the fluid velocity uh, when the fluid velocity varies. So here we have added the correction term into our theory, and we want to compare the accuracy when the DC is on and off. And when the DC is off, we can see that the, the theoretical data and the experimental data becomes much closer. However, there are still some spaces. So, so that means there is still being less considered term, however, however it's close enough, and we have to and we have to adapt to this accuracy. And also the for the different wind speed here, we can see the same tendency. And also for this chart. And then we want to compare it with the when the DC power when the, when the DC power supply is on. So we just compare the critical temperature. So by knowing the data, we can calculate its relative error and we can get the accuracy. And we can see that when the DC power supply is on, we can get the more accuracy. So let's jump to our conclusion. The first one is that our theory is equitable. However, we still need to consider heat conduction to the support of the social The third, uh, the, the second is the, that the actual parameters that affect the result are the small edge and the fluid velocity. The third one is the heat transfer coefficient then, uh, is depends on the fluid velocity. The fourth is that the, the accuracy of these methods is close to the standard value when the DC power supply is turned off. And this is our references. Thank you. The okay, question of opponent to the recorder. Three, uh, two minutes. So, um, I'm the opponent from the team addition. So, my first question is, um, if your input current uh, turns from AC to DC, does it bring any difference? Um, do you mean that if I change the power supply from AC to DC? Yes, from DC to AC. From DC to AC. From DC to AC. Um, actually, um, yes or no? Yes or no? Oh. Yes or no? Yes or no? I think yes. Okay, so my second question is, um, do you use the battery or the power supply? Power supply. Okay, so my third question is, um, is your observation video capable of representing the theorem? Because um, in the in your observation video, you just show all the setup, and you then see, and we can we are unknown, we are unable to know that um, what uh, what method did you do to um, fit this your uh, fit your theorem? Oh, um, we use that. So actually, this video is not. This we use the thermometer to measure the oil temperature, and okay, it's okay. indeed quite hot. Thank you. So you finish your question? Yes. Okay. So preparation of the opponent for three minutes.
Okay, time's up. Important, take the floor for four minutes. <clears throat> so, greetings to the uh, reporters team, the real team, and the jurors. I'm from Team Erudition, and today I'm going to oppose question number four, Winsby. So, in the problem statement, the key points that the reporter had is the first, they need to find the relationship between the wind speed and temperature. Secondly, uh, the accuracy of the method is also a need to be discussed. So here's my brief review for your observation. So the pros are you did high quality video, but the cons are um, you didn't you didn't show the heating coils, and it's unclear and too short. And the third part. So the pros are you probably said variables that are capable of representing the phenomena. Second. The, uh, we combine different equations to form a universal one. But the cons are too many assumptions that may differ with true conditions. And the Stephen Boltzmann, uh, the Stephen Boltzmann equation is written incorrectly. And its P radiation is epsilon times delta times A times T fourth. And the T is um, the T is the degree in, cell, uh, in Kelvin. But instead, you put um, the temperature distinction in your vi uh, video. So it's now the setup part. So the pros are, you did have good ideas, simple experiment equipment, and you speak clearly. But the cons are you play the video while introduction, and will be more detailed. And you didn't show exact experiment equipment and the process you did the experiment. And the experiment part, so pros are slow and clear reports, good type setting, but the cons are known R square value in the data graph. Um, experiment data is not enough, and you have unclear information in the graph. So here's my conclusion for the reports. The reporters provides us with a concise report, maybe a little bit too concise, too precise, Many important points regarding the report have been ignored. First, the coil in the observation video were not even shown clearly. Secondly, too many assumptions have been made that do not match true conditions. Third, there are plenty of clearless points occur occurring in the report, such as the Stephen Boltzmann equation being wrong, written wrong. Moreover, many, many variables and numbers do not match with each other. Of course, we would say that this report dis deserves a round of of a pause, of a large crowd of a pause. So, um, I think we can just go through it into the discussion part. Okay. Into the discussion. So, as you mentioned in the short question part, you mentioned that you use a thermometer to, um, to detect the, to measure the temperature, right? So, what's the minimum unit of the thermometer? I so mean, it's like uh, in is one degree, well, zero point one degree, or zero point zero one. So, do you think it's accurate enough? Mm, um, what we observe is the temperature changing rate. So, we think that the minimum units of the thermometer um, it might affect slightly, but not maybe the most important factor. So, do you mean that it affects slightly? So um is your so is so um so um is your um thermometer made in mercury or alcohol? 
since mercury thermometers may be not really that accurate. Uh, sorry, could you say that again? Um, is your is your thermometer made in mercury or alcohol? Oh, we use or sensor. Use uh, sensor. So, um, do you think it's accurate enough? Since, um, is your sensor um like infrared or something? Um, sorry, I didn't. So, um, what's the what's the uh, method? Of your thermometers to measure the um, to measure the temperature. It's conductive thermometer, and, and um, I mean, it's um, it's a device that is electric, and we use computer to read. So is it infrared? Sure. Okay. So I'm going to just just skip to the next question. So what's the minimum of unit of wind speed that you can detect through your method? What's the minimum units of this? Yes. I mean, uh, you mean the, you mean the meters per second? Yes. Yeah. Per second? Yes. Yes, well, the, uh, well, we use the units of, of meter per second, however, we can, what? But there's a huge difference between one meter per second and two meter per second, right? So if your minimum unit is one meter per second, so that 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 doesn't can even that's not what uh, the problem state needs. Mm, <laughs> I think that's the device we use to measure the wind speed. Um, I think the minimum units may be not enough to meet your to meet your expectation. However, the however the theoretical value can be calculated to this just. It will be more accurate, and we use this accurate number to fit the uh, to to see if it fits the experimental data. Okay, so my fourth question is about the Stephen Boltzmann law in your your report. So, as in Stephen Boltzmann, so you ask in Stephen Boltzmann law, it says that um, the radiant power is epsilon times delta times and the area times t in the power of four. So I mean, where did you get that equation? Since um, the the radiation, the power of radiation should be um, the temperature should be united in in Kelvin. So that's that's not t one in the power of four minus t two in the power of four. So we got this formula from the paper we just provided in the version. So, so we think it's applicable, and also if, um, as just you said, if the, uh, so if we just apply the T one with the power of the of four, um, I think that's um, even that's uh, even if this formula is much more correct than this. Um, but, but that's not more correct than this. So, you know, um, zero degrees Celsius is 273 um, degree Kelvin. So, and 12, 270 degrees in the polar form may be an enormous number. Well, yes, I have to admit, is our most accurate formula. Um, but um, as we um, after we added the correction factor, the heat conduction to the wire, there will still be some spaces, and um, we have to admit that just some point we need to improve. Okay, so um, my first question is, could you please turn to um, the slide of your theorem, which um, it's uh, it's describing the resistance. Resistance will change when the temperature changes, right? So, did you, have you do any experiments about this? Since um, uh, you use um, so the power of heat is going to be I squared R for for um, so uh, when the R changes with the temperature, the heat, the power of heat may change either. So. 
it will it, it will bring effects to you know um, equilibrium temperature. But um, as when we expanded the whole formula, it will become more Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, so 
Next is the opponent summarize the discussion. One minute. So uh, my question, my first question is, what's the minimum unit of the thermometer? And the, the reporter answers me that it's about 0.1 degrees Celsius. And my second my second question is, the temperature of the photo is oh, I, I missed this question. I'm sorry. And my third question is, what's the minimum unit of wind speed that you can detect through your method? And the reporter answers me that the uh, the smallest units is 0.1 meter per second or one meter per second. I just forgot it. And we, as we can see, there is 0.0001 wind speed. So I think it's um, quite confusing. So this fourth Stephen Boltzmann law is just the reporter's fault. And the fifth question is the change of resistance with T. And the reporter answers me that it can be ignored. And six and seven. I'm going to talk about the analysis of errors and reporters say that he didn't do it. Okay, thumbs up. I apologize. Okay. Question of the viewer to reporter and opponent. For three minutes. Yeah. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Hello Chan and I'm the reviewer of the Nonider no in Taipei Microscope. First, I want to ask a question that since no one actually defined what is the convention, can anyone define what is the convention and how does the convention change the wire temperature of the wire that you measure? Um, so I have to answer that question. Either, either device is fine. Yeah. Um, um, so um, when you find the convection to the fluid, uh, means the heat loss to the to the mean, mean the temperature of the coil that that loses heat, um, but the but the now definition is from the paper we have in the paper. So we use this now. I don't know if it's correctly, but we we that's this So as in my answers, I'm going to say that the convention is divided into two parts. The first is the natural convention. It means that uh, the density, the, the density distinctions is um, uh, makes it makes uh, the something flows into another one. And the second second part is the force convention. So there is an internal force about it. There, there's inter, internal force applied on it. So um, it may do um, just not. Uh, it's unrelevant to. Okay, thank you. And also, second point, I want to ask, uh, since you use, uh, send the wind speed to, let's say this is the wire, and you send the wind speed for this way, what, what happens if you send the wind speed to this way? Yeah. So, there's a hole, and you send the wind speed to this way, right? But what if you send the wind speed to this way, inside of the hole? Can you explain what are some difference and what might be impact? So you're saying that uh, because when you when you look at the side view, it maybe con has more contact point that the wind speed can cause. So I'll talk about that later. And last question is, uh, can can anyone explain what's the relation correlation between the ohmic heating and the cooling due to the, due to the wind speed? Uh, so, what is the correlation between correlationship between the ohmic heating and the cooling due to the wind? Ohmic heating. So the part. Yeah. What is ohmic heating? Ohmic heating is the because there's a resistance. There's the heating is created from the power supply, right? So that's the ratio of the heat transfer due to the power supply. Okay. Thumbs up. Okay. Free version of reviewer for two minutes. <laughs>
Okay, time's up. Review and take the floor for four minutes. statement, I'll just write down into the main focuses. I believe that main focus are the relationship between the omic heat due to the power supply and also cooling heat due to the wind. And also we think that the conventional heat and the relationship to the radiation and the condition it is important that we need to show this insignificant as an actual number, not just saying that it's insignificant. Also we think that contacting air fluid volume to the wind's wire and its impact is the main thing that we need to focus on. So reporter Perfman was pretty good overall uh, because he uh, she did a lot of clear mathematical explanation to, for the theory and also she well drawn the uh, schematic explanation for the experiment. However, um, uh, first there is some lack of explanation for the experimental setup and also video. And they didn't uh, explain the physical application for the theoretical equation. And very few number of the parameters are tested. And and opponent also did a really good job because uh, he has really clear and concise sentences and points. Uh, and he got a lot of pro cons and also notation issues in the equation. Uh, but I think you could improve more uh, focus. I think not trying to not focus on the wrong notation, but trying to focus on the not unit, but maybe actual thing that we need to talk about as a mean speed. So, so first, this question is about the um, thermometer issues because uh, the opponent catch out that there's a sen using sensor and the uh, reporter says it's insignific insignificant point. And I think this is the blur the genuine discussion between the wind speed. And second point, uh, reporter opponent asked about the accuracy referred from the paper, paper because there's a rotation issue as well. And then uh, the reporter said it's referred from the uh, research paper, but I also think this is irrelevant, irrelevant discussion for this topic. They also discuss about the formula, substitution, and explanation about the derivation, and also analyze about the errors and future improvement, like uh, suggesting some new independent variable. And here's uh, here's the point missed that I think. First of all, uh, they didn't uh, directly mention about the correlation between the omic heating and the cooling of the wind's, uh, wind's heat transfer. For example, uh, due to the power supply in the resistor, uh, there is a omic heating from the power supply that hit the wire. But there is a wind that cooling the temperature down, so I want some more direct uh, relationship between those two. And also, uh, the, I believe that the convention of the convention heat defi defined as the volume of the air fluid that contact to the yeah contact to the <coughs> contact with the wires. Uh, and I also recommend other independent variables such as direction of the speed as like other uh, direction and also different type of wire, different thickness of the uh, wires because it blocks the wind, wind fluid fluxing into the wire as well. And also, uh, I want it's better to talk about why the experimental and the theoretical data is different because it costs the error. And also, uh, cal the point miss is the actual calculation to prove that the radiation and the conventional heat transfer are insignificant. So it's better if you guys provide actual ratio for the number of, the, uh, for example, like radiation heat and then actual conventional heat that is insignificant. And also, uh, different in the result of the wind heat, the cold is different direction, which is similar to the one I mentioned in the uh, new independence variables. So, yeah. So overall, uh, they did a really good job, but I want that I want that it they can improve by talking more uh, independent variables. Thank you. Okay. That's a uh, uh, remark of reporter for two minutes.
um, I mean, that's the destruction of the of, of the coil temperature and the ambient temperature is correct. And the second is that, uh, uh, as for the reviewer, is that if we change the if we change the direction of the wind, it may affect the cross sectional area. And I think that's a good point we have to improve more. And help, um, in the next we can we can do more experiment. So. Um, the, uh, the third, one, the third one is that um, no matter how we, uh, um, no matter how we did the experiment, we have added the correction term, and we have, we have answered the accuracy. So we think that um, after adding the correction term, the uh, the theoretical data will become much closer, a lot to the experimental data. And in this point, we think we have indeed missed the problem statement. So we think that, um, although there are still a lot of things we have to improve more in the future, however, we have still missed the common state. Thank you. So let's move to the last stage, the uh, question of jury. Any question? So I think the problem statement, I uh, really want to ask, what is the accuracy of this method? Measuring the wind speed. Mm -hmm. So uh, this means that uh, 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 the reporter you should explain now uh, whether how you calibrate and how you measure the wind speed. You should use a calibrate device to measure the wind speed so you can compare uh, your experiment against. And the other thing is uh, this is a temperature measurement. I don't know how you did it because uh, uh, you were not very clear about the sensor type. And then whether you are measuring the uniform or average. Uh, is a coil temperature that's not clear, or maybe you are just measuring uh, the single point on the sensor. So uh, this is not clear. Maybe, maybe you can comment on this. So um, in our observation video, we can see that at the first we use a thermal to measure the center of the coil, and I think that's the that, that's the main point we have to undergo this experiment, and also. And, and also, I, um, I have to say sorry to our short observation video because um, if we want to let a coil, um, let a coil cool down, it needs at least two minutes to three minutes. So it, it can be seen in the chart we just provide in our report. So I think, um, so I think um, this this picture may answer the problem. You know, this is a more complicated thing because you have this uh, heat exchange between your coil and the sensor. Okay, you are measuring basically measuring the air temperature around it, around the sensor. Mm -hmm. You are not actually measuring the temperature on the coil. But, but we have contact the thermometer to the coil. So at the top of the thermometer is the most sensitive point that you will, it will measure the temperature. So we just put this point on our core. Okay. So any more questions? For well, since you talk about uh, analyzing the error, how do you analyze the error based on the uh, reporter's data? So um, first of all, I'm going to change um, the equipment which provides the cool wind flow. So I'm going to use the vacuum cleaner instead, and which I'm going to attach a long tube to it, and put the tubes um, or, um, just facing the um, ohms, uh, just the resistance or the coil. Since on the fence is pulling like this, so in Bernoulli's law, we can see that if the area gets bigger, the, the wind speed gets um, smaller. So if, it, if you use the tube instead, and you can measure it with the annual meter um, to measure the wind speed, so it could, it could be more accurate. Okay. Any more question? I'll give uh, this uh, review uh, question. So this uh, reporter talked about uh, this uh, uh, measurement of temperature yeah. of this uh, measurement in this uh, so-called DC on mode yeah. and DC off mode. Yes. So I want you to comment on the 
uh, is the national strategy. Sorry, can you repeat one more time? Oh, she's a reporter. Yeah. Had, uh, she has uh, said about, talk about this uh, PC of mode. Yes. And look at this time uh, evolution of uh, temperature and rotating as well. So PC of mode, PC on mode. So I want you to comment on this uh, uh, this management strategy and what's the advantage and what's the disadvantage of this? Well, I think that's a really good question because I have a lot of thought. It's a PC on and off is this that function. So we, so we uh, there is, might be some error that it, we can guarantee that it will reach the same amount every time. But the positive part of the using PC on and off switch will be uh, you can control you can make the voltage as a independent variable, but the negative part might be and so we've got uh, a, um, another answer for it. So um, as she used the power supplier in his in her experiments, so maybe she could adjust the um, input voltage of it or the input current of it. So uh, instead, instead of just using um, on and off to describe the phenomenon. Okay. okay. So, I finish the question, jury. So please write down the score. Okay, so we have our score. So let's show the score of reporter. Five, six, seven, eight, six, and six. Okay, let's see the score of opponent. Five, six, six, eight, six. And five. The last one is the score of the year. Seven, 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 six, eight, and seven. Okay. So we finish this stage. And we will uh, still take a five minute break. And uh, please come back in five minutes. Okay? Thank you. So the opponent challenged the reporter the problem. Uh, we would like to challenge the reporter to number five synchronized candles. Uh, will you reject the uh, offer, whatever? Yes. <laughs> 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 okay. Okay. Uh, we would like to challenge you to number 16 ultrasonic phone. We reject it. We reject it, sorry. <laughs> Um, we would like to challenge you to um, number. Oh, wait a moment, sorry.
We would like to challenge you to number two, circling magnets. Yeah. Challenge accepted. Stage in this, the problem in this stage is circling magnets. So that uh, lets the preparation of reporter for five minutes.
Okay, thanks up. Presentation of reporter for 12 minutes. Okay, so afternoon guys. Uh, I'm from Team Nerd Edition and today I have for you the number two problem of TYPT circling magnets. So this is our outline. So first of all, we're gonna talk about our problem. Then you can take a look at our very clear and precise observation video. And third, we have some parameters for discussion. Sorry, for discussion. And then we can proceed into the theory part and then the experiment part, experiment part where we try to prove our theory. And then we can get our conclusions. So this is our problem statement. But a magnets with different diameters are attached to each end of a cylindrical battery. When placed on an aluminum foil, the object start to, starts to circle. Investigate how the motion depends on relevant parameters. So we have two key questions for this problem statement. So first of all, what is the cause of the motion? And second, which type of the circular motion is the battery's motion, such as a uniform accelerating motion? And moreover, what are the dependent variables and independent variables of this motion? Here's the observation video. As you can see, the battery is moving in a circular motion. Nice, huh? Okay, so these are the results for our observation. So these are some characteristics of the motion. So first of all, only NIMH batteries attached to NDFEB magnets could help demonstrate the phenomenon properly, which we'll, we will discuss the reason later. And the motion is a pure rolling motion, and the battery reaches terminal angular velocity eventually. And last but not least, the direction of magnetic, magnetic poles of, of magnets on each end are opposite with each other. And from after like some analyzing in Tracker and MATLAB, we can get our function of the motion as shown below. And the correlation coefficient is 0 0.9813. Okay, so here are the parameters for discussion. Circling magnets, we have some independent, vari independent variables. So I might change the radius of the magnets and the batteries. And we also have some control variables, such as the type of magnets and the uh, aluminum foil. We also have some dependent variables, the radius of the motion, the driving force, the terminal speed, and the, and the internal resistance, and the electric, electric motor force, omnivari, and we change the some, some variables. So okay, we can get in our theory part. So the first first part of, of the theory, we're talking about Lorentz force. So as we can see in the, in the gram on the right hand side, the direction of the Lorentz force is actually opposite to the direction of the motion. Hence, there must be some other force playing the role of the driving force. And we believe that it is friction doing so. However, since the friction has larger movement arm, moment arm, if the friction contributes the momentum, the torque produced by the friction would overwhelm the torque produced by the Lorentz force. And uh, so let, let me put it in a clear, clear, clearer way. So like the battery it spins this way, but it moves this way. And that is what, not what we uh, observe. So we kind of need a theory for, for the normal force now. So the wheels, magnets, and the surface, aluminum foil, aren't hard, ideal rigid bodies. But since the magnet is much harder than the foil, so we can consider the magnet to be relatively rigid. And so to maintain pure rolling, the application point of the normal force should be shown as the picture on the right hand side. And when the speed increases, the x2 would move forward, and the application point of the normal force would move forward too. And theory part three, terminal speed. 
So our observ observation indicates that the battery reaches a terminal speed eventually. So uh, we got some thoughts on this. So the magnitude of normal force and Lorentz force is constant. However, the friction isn't. So it's probably what causes the movement to be at a terminal speed. And the application point of the normal force is dependent to the speed of, of the battery. As the speed increases, the moment arm of the normal force will become smaller. In order to maintain pure rolling, the, fr the friction will become smaller too. Finally, as the friction decreases to the same value as the, the Lorentz force, there is no force applied, so the system reaches terminal speed. And we can assume that F0 is the friction value when the system is stationary, and F is the friction at any time. We suppose, as according to the results, that F equals F0 minus CV times FD, and it, it, we, can, we can translate into F0 minus big F. So we apply an analog of a point of a mass motion in a force field with damping force, and we can get the equation of the motion. And by solving this ODE, we can get uh, the equation for the speed. And since our motion is a perfect circular motion, the, equa the, the equation above could be substituted with omega. And the function of, the, of position is as shown here. So here are our theoretic conclusions and prediction. So any battery could provide electromotive force. Therefore, although the system couldn't accelerate itself in some cases, if we substitute the NIMH battery with other kinds of batteries, the de deceleration of the battery should be smaller and the system should reach a terminal speed in the end. So the motion of any battery system should also be able to fit in this equation. And due to the physical meanings of the constants B0 and B2, the product M B0, B2 equals FD should have positive correlation with the electromotive force divided by total resistance, since the Lorentz force also decides the value of F0. And the following zero experiments are to confirm our predictions. So this is our first experiment. This is a, a pretty famous experiment known as the four terminal method yes and it is used to measure the internal resistance and the EMF of, of, of stuff and in this case we use it to measure the battery so these are the steps uh, it's actually quite a simple experiment so we'll just skip it and now for the for experiment two uh, this, this experiment is the main one we're doing here today. So we're going to film the motion of the battery system and analyze it with Tracker and MATLAB. And here is the setup. So part one, we're going to film the motion. So we set up the apparatus as shown in the previous page or on the left side. Uh, and we attach the button magnets to the ends of the battery and put it on the aluminum foil. Uh, so in some cases, in some cases, it moves on its own. But if, if it doesn't, we can provide an initial velocity to the battery system. And then we film the motion with the camera up above there until the system reaches terminal speed or it just stops. And then we can analyze our motion. So we use Tracker to analyze the motion. And we set the origin to the middle of the circle. And then we can proceed to part three, modeling. So we use MATLAB to fit the data to the mathematical model, and if anyone is interested in the code, it's in, it's in Appendix A. Okay, so here are the results for experiment one. As you guys can see, uh, the Philips NIMH AA battery has the smallest internal resistance, and uh, it also has a relatively high EMF. And experiment two results. So, we can, we can try and squeeze out uh, our force applied on the battery in, in this part of the result. And we can get that the NIMH AA battery also has the highest value. And now we can get in our conclusion, prediction confirmation one. So except for the AAA group, 
the correlation coefficient of each group is larger than 0 0.94. So the reason for this triple, this NIMH triple A battery to be so bad is because that it's it's kind of small, you know. The ca the gasket doesn't fit. So 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 the real so the results naturally they aren't going to be good. And um, as we uh, load our numbers, we can see that. Uh, the force applied is actually actually has a positive correlation with the uh, I I uh, yeah the okay you guys know what I is uh, it's in positive correlation with I and so for the final conclusion so for question one in the key points the cause of the ro rolling is due to the Lorentz force but the moment momentum is actually provided by friction. And the driving force has positive correlation with the current. Oh yeah, it's called the electric current. And the direction of the mag magnetic field decides the direction of the motion, which is opposite with the direction of the Lorentz force, since the momentum is actually not caused by the Lorentz force. Okay. And so for question two, the motion of the battery is a pure rolling, but with rolling resistance. The motion could be successfully described by the mathematical as shown below. Moreover, we also interpreted the physical meaning of the constants uh, like B0, B1, and B2. And if you want more details, you can go back to the theory section. And that is all I have for you today. Thanks for listening. Okay. Question of opponent to reporters. So okay. Uh, so you said that in your uh, you would talk about uh, more stuff about the terminal speed. Can you show yeah. us what you were going to talk about? What about terminal speed? Terminal speed? You said you're going to talk more about it later in the presentation, but we didn't see that. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, I, I think you misunderstood me. I meant like uh, I'm not sure the reason why. So the reason why is is actually shown. Let me. Uh, that, that's all right. That's all right. So, are yeah. okay? Are you are you saying that the movement of the mag the movement of the uh, body is caused by the friction? Yep. Okay. Um, and so, I, did you test any parameters other than like the uh, different different batteries? Different. Yeah. Yeah. Man. Mm -hmm. so, it's like it's like over over here, like those. So, so it those are different batteries, batteries, right? Yeah. Did you test any cool. other parameters? What other parameters did you test? Other parameters? Because actually, only the Phillips Phillips Nim H double A. But with magnets, like, so. did you? That's a battery. Did you yeah. test different magnets or strengths or numbers of batteries? Oh no, nope. we don't think that's we think that's kind of irrelevant. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Can you, you talked, you said experiment one was very famous. Can you explain its relevance to the actual, we didn't, we didn't understand its relevance. Hmm? What, what so, was it? So, so in order to calculate and analyze experiment two, we actually have to do experiment one first to get our numbers needed, such as the internal resistance and the electromotive force. So experiment one was just measuring those values. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, and then, uh, also, did you, do you have any um, lines showing the, the difference between your theoretical values and your experimental data? Excuse me? Do you have any graphs showing the difference okay. between your... Okay. I'm sorry. Oh. Yeah. Uh, prepare the preparation for appointment for a minute. <laughs> I've been shy, but where is it? About three minutes. <laughs>
okay, it's the time to for opponent take the floor for four minutes. depends on relevant parameters. So our ideal um, method of analysis for this was to first explain uh, why the circling phenomenon occurs and explain its underlying principles. Second, we think that we need to model and observe the circling behavior and uh, understand how it changes based on different conditions and parameters. We personally believe that testing all these different conditions and parameters is relevant because they do have their own effects on the different dependent variables like the radius. So the premise of the report were the good phenomenon observation video. Uh, we thought it was nice, like they said. And uh, the cons were that they did not test very many parameters that we thought were quite relevant to the phenomenon. Uh, and their argument about friction didn't really make sense. Friction will oppose motion, but the force of friction won't cause the object to move on its own. And uh, so the overall theory we thought was illogical, um, and it didn't really relate to how the actual battery, when connected to the aluminum with the magnets, actually creates a current which causes uh, a force because of the magnetic field. And so we thought that was the ideal theory. So we thought that the theory could have been much better. Also, they, didn't, they had lacked units, and they didn't really show how they derived the Lorentz force stuff that was still confusing. And also, the slide organization was somewhat uh, illogical. They talked about how they would go back to talking about the terminal velocity when they didn't really explain that. Next, please. So yeah, so we think the points that we want to discuss are the different parameters. If they didn't uh, actually analyze those, we think that it would be good if we at least uh, ask them and try to see what they thought would be the effect. And um, we talk about the theory based on friction causing the motion alone. Doesn't really make sense, but we do think that friction, the rolling friction, is integral to the theory. So we do think that that's still important. And so I want to talk about uh, that. And um, Another thing was uh, talking about the stability and balance because with this, it's very precise. The rolling friction is enough that it makes it sometimes hard, as they said, to make the actual magnet actually move. As they said, the battery, only certain batteries, they were able to get make the magnet move, the, the, but the body move in a circle. So the effect of the grooves in the aluminum foil, as we saw there, it seemed as though between trials they didn't like clear the 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 foil. They instead kind of left the grooves in, which could affect how the uh, body moves, and uh, just we wanted to discuss terminal speed a little bit more because we thought that was unclear. And for the theory, uh, we wanted to just talk about the derivation for the like, electromotive force and how that works, and also the definitions of the variables. Um, and also, they said that they it moves in the opposite direction of the Lorentz force um, because of friction. We didn't really get that, so we wanted a qualitative explanation, and so I think that we can get that in our discussion. So we have the discussion. Oh, it's no back. Oh, yeah. Okay. Have the reporter, please. Okay. Uh, so just so just to start off, um, how did you did you control the like stability of the table and making sure it's completely flat? Yeah. Yeah. Of course, man. Okay. Okay. And then um, also with the we saw that there were grooves in the observation video. Yeah. Uh, did you clear those between trials at all? Like, yes, that, that's the observation video, not the experiment <laughs> video. So, so yeah. So between we, the experiments, between each experiment, you cleared the groups. Between yes. The, yes. Okay. Okay. Um, I would recommend in the future kind of showing the observation video how you did the experiments. Uh, all right. Um, and then uh, also for the rolling experiment, I just want to clarify. You said that essentially there's a Lorentz force, and the friction, the rolling friction. Causes it to move in the opposite direction. That's that double toy three was. You're like repeating it again. So there's a Lorentz force in one direction that causes it to torque in one direction, yeah. and the friction, the rolling friction, opposes that and causes it to move in the opposite directions because of friction. Was that the theory? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then uh, we just thought to quickly go over some parameters that we thought you could improve uh, and study in the next one which was the like, layers of aluminum foil to kind of resist the grooves forming, and like, testing different strengths of magnets. 
and numbers of batteries, voltages of batteries. There's lots of parameters that I feel like are relevant because they would change the outcomes. So, but just, just I'm wondering, what do you think uh, increasing the strength of the magnets would, uh, how would that affect the result? Increasing the strength of the magnets. Uh, I suppose the 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 speed of the terminal speed will probably like go up, but but I can't be a hundred percent sure because because like I said, the my theory clearly states that the the movement comes from friction, so they they are related, of course, but yeah. And what about like if you increase the number of batteries? Your your theory was based on friction alone, so by your by your theory, would increasing the number of batteries have any effect on the radius? Mm. Uh, it depends on how you increase the batteries. Like how? Uh, there, make, uh, there's a there's a two kinds. Of, okay, I've learned this in junior high. Uh, there's like this way and this way. <coughs> So uh, the magnets are on the two sides here, increasing, making my two uh, affecting each other like that. Yeah, like like this one. Yes. How that affected? And I suppose the uh, um, the speed. Yeah, I think it would, it would go up. Uh, the terminal velocity. Yeah. And the rotation acceleration. The, the rotation. The acceleration of the the rotational acceleration of the body will it increase? Will it increase? Yes. Okay, okay. And then, so I just wanted to, uh, you, you thought the low end force and the friction force caused the, it caused the body to move, but friction can't actually cause, uh, if, if one, if this, say just, that is the box, the force, the low end force say wants it to go in this direction, uh, L, then the friction force in another direction can't exceed the low end force, it can't. Yeah. So then, how is it moving? Okay, so here's something else I've also learned in junior high. So, um, like when you walk, it actually uh, works by friction, and when you ride a bike, it also works by friction. So, so the case here is is not like this. You know, this we're not we're not talking about like just. Pushing something. No, 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 no. That's not the case. That is the case. The Lorentz force is causing it to be. It's, it's, it has a force in this direction, yeah. say. So you're saying the body is walking in junior high, and so I'm just, I'm just confused about how that relates. So, so, uh, let me. So, so you know, like when there's like when you're stepping forward, you're actually applying a force backwards, but the friction is actually pushing you, you know that? We've never like, heard of it before because it's like, not a different school. Okay, I think that, I don't think that this relates to walking so much. It's, there's a force on it. It's not, it's not, yeah. a, it's not, it's not an animal. And, and this, this, okay, this, I just want to also I wanna think, ask about another force that I think is important and actually the reason for the motion. So we have a magnet here, uh, two magnets. In between them is a battery. Looks kind of like a wait, but like okay, there, and then it's on a sheet of foil, right? So there's a current here, battery. There's a current, say, in this direction. I shouldn't be drawing the same color, but there's there's a current that goes here, here, down, here. It goes in this arc, and then also there's in your the way you showed it, I believe. Ah, sorry about that. Uh, this is the south end, this is the north end, this is the north end, this is the south end. So in that, with that uh, experimental setup, there should be uh, a magnetic field in this direction from the north to south pole. That's how magnetic fields go. And so basically, at this, uh, right here, uh, there's, uh, because of, if we just use the right hand rule, there's a force in this direction, a uh, magnetic uh, field in this direction, and then there's a current downwards, so therefore there's going to be a force outwards, and so it's going to push the magnet towards the viewer, this is towards the viewer, and then here the current is upwards, and the magnetic field, because it's north and south the other direction, is going to be this way, so it's going to be also a force in this direction towards the viewer, which is going to cause it to come forward. 
So do you think that magnetic force, like, do you think that's not related and it's smaller than the Oh, uh, I think force? that this is a very, very excellent idea. However, um, according to, like, this regulations here, I'm going to uh, translate it real quick. And when, when the opponent is having a combo with me, and you shouldn't, you shouldn't like switch to your own view of the question. So, so. No, I'm not switching to my own view. I'm just asking. If this is this force is obviously part of the problem. Yeah, yeah, it, it is part of the so, problem. So, but you're, are you saying it's insignificant relative to the Lorentz force? Oh. Uh, because. No. Nope. So okay. it's not in your theory. It matters. But where is it in your theory then? It's not in my theory because that's not the way I look at it. So the way, so basically, there's magnetic force in this direction, which will cause it to, because this is a smaller, it'll rotate, it'll end up going in an arc, in a full circle. But you think that basically, because there's a, because of the Lorentz force this way, there's gonna actually be a friction in the other direction, so you think that this force, you think that the Lorentz force and friction force completely overpower this magnetic um, force? Is that what you're saying? This, this, this thing really yeah. If there's, if there's magnetic force in this direction, towards the viewer, and it's gonna come and rotate in this way because say this magnet is smaller. Wait, so a moment, a moment. It's like let me just structure my thoughts real quick. So so so, yeah. so uh, I I do not think that this is um you might you might want to consider consider this, yeah, of course, but I do not think that this is because because we can see it's it's not providing any torque. Yes, it is. It's there's a force in this direction, how, how and so it providing it's a at a, because so this is the center. It, it's there's a force in this direction at some radius. These are radii from the center of the circle, uh -huh. and so that's going to be a torque in rotating this direction because of that. And there's a force this way, which will be because it's at a certain radius from the center point, it'll become a torque. That's how torque works. Then. Uh, no, no, I don't work like this. You said it's kind of like this. If it's like this, then it's not going to roll, man. I don't think that's going to roll. It's going gonna, gonna to do like a sliding thing. Here, I, I've here, never seen here like this is the center slide. motion. This is the little magnet thing image. And so, the body. And it's, it's, there's a force in this direction, is it not? It's from this magnetic force. Same, same way your Lorentz force theory and friction yeah, 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 yeah. And so basically, this magnet is smaller, and it, it's it's not enough to actually have sliding friction. Uh, if, if it's not, because you said that it stayed in those grooves, then it's gonna move here and turn this direction and come in a full arc because this this magnet has a small radius. Okay, so so. But I just want I just want to ask. So you still think that your theory about having the you still think that there's going to be a Lorentz force and there's going to be friction that's going to be in the opposite direction of the Lorentz force? You still think that it works? Yes, it works. And therefore, it works. You, so the friction is what causes the move. Yes. Uh, okay. And, and then one other thing, I just want to go back because we're running out of time. You thought that all those parameters were irrelevant. Can you just explain why for a moment those were irrelevant? Because we thought those would have an effect on the radius. Okay, I think, I think that uh, both of us did the experiment, why? Like, right? But we are actually going in very different ways. You see, our, our key questions, we're not even, we didn't even even talk about the parameter. That's, that, that's not our, our key points. Problem statement depends on relevant parameters. That's part yeah, of the problem yeah, statement. Yeah. That's part of it. So yeah. you just don't, you don't think those are, you don't analyze? That's part of the problem statement. So. Uh, it's, we just figured that in. We just think there's more relevant parameters we could have uh, tried. Okay, thumbs up. Okay. So, opponent summarizing the discussion for one minute. Oh, oh. Yeah. Um, so, the opponent talked about the Lorentz force, but continued to remain unclear about how the friction somehow causes the motion because friction alone can't cause the motion in a, the opposite direction. And so, it doesn't make sense for the Lorentz force to completely overpower the magnetic force, which would presumably be much stronger. And they actually completely ignored the magnetic force, which we figured was the intent of the problem, problem because the magnetic force is going to be very strong. Um, and the opponent like continued to fail to explain the illogical con concept of friction causing the motion, and they stuck with their theory, even though I explained how they could improve it. 
Um, and so they they seemed to believe that it was a torque, and it was just from the magnetic force, and that it will it will slide, not rotate. And they continued, even though I asked them to explain how the uh, those all those parameters that they could have tested were irrelevant, even though okay, sorry, I asked. Let me stop. Okay. So question of reviewer to reporter and the opponent for three minutes. So now I have a, so now I have a very important question. Like, this is the main discussion. What is the main cause of the rotation? The main cause of the movement? Yes. Well, we believe that it's going to be the uh, magnetic force because the magnetic force is going to be very strong compared to their argument that the theory, that, sorry, that the friction was somehow going to cause it, that doesn't really make sense. So we think it's the magnetic force. Yes, but what about the circle in motion? What causes the circle in motion? Uh, because, it's at, because one of the magnets has a smaller radius, it, it's not going to go in one direction. Okay, and what do you think? Okay. Do I think? Uh, I think I've stated it pretty clearly. You think it is friction, right? Yep. Okay. Thank you. And now for the for the for the, for the second question, you did you find the find the threshold of the of the bolts that the magnet will not start to rotate, um, and that your device will not start to rotate, and you give the force and make it rotate. Did you find the electrical moving force of the battery? Like like how low does it go before it doesn't move by its own? Yes. What is the voltage? Um, that is actually very hard to measure since we only have so much types of battery, so no, that's not what we uh, need. You can just use a multimeter to measure. Okay, just use a what? Use a multimeter to measure the voltage. Can I add to this? Yes, you can add to this. So when they uh, put the, in the battery this set up, it's going to be a short circuit. So the uh, the battery is going to run through energy very fast, and so the voltage will quickly decrease. So just using this experimental setup, you can test the voltage at different times, uh, and then see how if it starts to not move at all, and then test the voltage at that time. So yes, that will be the threshold. Yes, and this will lead to my third question: is like, what will what will happen? What is the relationship of the volts and current and the resistance in this in the circuit? What do you think? Volt, current, and resistance? Yes. That's Ohm's law, V equals IR. That's it. Yes. Yes. Same here, V equals IR. Okay. Yes. No. And, and the, the, you have an equation, right? The more equation of motion. But I, but in the, in the introduction, we said that Lorentz force will start the motion, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's the original cause of the motion. Why, why didn't you calculate the Lorentz force? Sure. Calculate the Lorentz force? Yes. Oh, no, we're, we're, we're looking at a total energy, no, total force per se, perspective instead of a, of a what does this cost, what does this cost. We're, we're just like adding it all up together and yeah, and doing it. Yeah, and you think that the Lorentz force is the main cause? I don't think that Lorentz okay. force is the main cause. Time, time is up. Magnetic force. So it's a preparation of the viewer for two minutes.
I'm the reviewer for problem to circling magnets. So problem statement has been set by the reporter and the opponent. And task for the for this problem statement, task one is, is to thoroughly investigate every parameters that affects the dynamics of the batter, which I believe could be improved better. The second is to derive a quantitative theoretical model for the motion of the cylindrical battery. And task three is to design a controlled and effective experimental setup. And I don't, I don't, and I don't think the reporter has to do it. And then to quantify and, quali and qualitatively explain the phenomenon, um, which is the the reporter's part has a bit deep, has a bit deep, uh, it's not as same as mine. And the task bar is varying the key parameters and compared with the theoretical model presented. So summary of the report. First, I understand the problem. I think that the report has qualitative interpretation of a the problem. They give the cause of the problem uh, and the polarization in the observation video. And the theoretical analysis, they give a quantitative analysis, which is the, the equation of motion by the friction. And the terminal, they give a terminal speed and they they find this is this a pure rolling situation, but I think that the theoretical analysis could be better. And for the experimental confirmation, they just find the inner resistance of the battery. So the merits is that they have a controlled experimental setup and a fluent and loud voice, but they didn't that they didn't answer on the statement, which is in, which is investigate the circular motion of the device, and so you should. Focus on the angular angular acceleration and the rotation of the device more, and they could have a more serious attitude. And they have many irrelevant parameters. So, and they said that the magnetic field is not important, and they didn't compare the data with theoretical result. And I think they are not familiar with the problem. So, summary of the opposition: some key sites, they 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 said what are the main parameters for this problem, and they explain the rotation, which is the, the magnetic field strength and the terminal speed. And the, some merits from the opponent is he pointed out the experimental errors and get the problem statement very well and give suggestion to the reporter and has a good manner. But some best possible next steps is that he shouldn't give explanation for a problem you should just discuss what the reporter has said and can focus more on the data but not the theory. So the first discussion is a setup. Uh, the opponent raised that what happens if uh, connect in parallel or in, in series, which is when it has a higher electromotive force, the reporter responds a higher rotation acceleration and terminal speed, which I agree with both both of them. The second is did you renew? He asked the reporter, did you renew the board for it? And the reporter said yes. And we think that it's important to keep the board board flat. And some general uh, suggestions. I think to find you need to find the dominant resistance in the circuit. Also determine if the current measured by the multimeter is precise. The second is measure how the current drop with time. Thus it will actually become rotating slower with time. And you have to plot a voltage versus the current graph to determine the resistance. And fourth, you okay, should give force time's up. So the device. concluding remark of reporter, two okay, minutes. So originally, I was going to talk about uh, I was going to talk about the opponent's questions and my answers, but I think that we've all been leading to the same question here, this one. So I'm going to I had a, like a quick analysis earlier so so here's my explanation okay it's like this right and we all know it's a pure rolling motion 
So this force must equal friction, no matter it is magnetic force, Lorentz force, whatever you say, okay? But there's this huge, huge point right here. Uh, the torque here is this one, and torque here is this one. According to Pythagoras theorem, um, this one, this, this line is longer than this one, thus this, uh, the torque produced by this one would be, of course it would be larger, so, so yeah. I think it's it's quite acceptable, and and I, I still think that it's it's kind of wrong too. I mean, the regulation says that you shouldn't do that. Why are you still doing that? Come on, okay? And we've all been on the same question, so that's all I have to say. Thanks. Okay. Question or jury? Yes, so I think uh, there's a, uh, I think a debate over about this friction. What's the cause of the motion? Yes, I'm curious. Uh, maybe all of you can answer this question. Have you tried to calculate the sign of the Lorentz force or any electric body force? So, for example, how sure that the motion direction is up opposite to the Lorentz force, for example? to try to look at this sign issue because right. that's important to I think we, we drew like we like drew a graph on this problem yeah but but my HDMI is not connected now so so I'll just show it here instead or here you can see uh, like it's we, we actually show this in this slide and uh, the following eight, nine slides over there. So, so uh, I guess your question is directed towards them. I'm sorry for answering. Well, not this one. Yeah. So, uh, so my question: How sure about the sign of the Lorentz force is opposite to the motion? Because in the video, we can really how how sure? How sure? Oh yeah, because like in this video, we can clearly see it because like. We got our our uh, magnetic magnetic poles like N and S, so so it shouldn't be moving like this. If Lorentz force is the force causing it, then I think it should be moving. Maybe other uh, for example opponent and maybe we can come in a clockwise. I think that I'm just gonna bring up my point from before about how if there's a Lorentz force in one direction causing a torque in one direction the friction in the other direction can't cause it to be moving in the other direction, so I still think that their theory kind of doesn't actually really make sense there, because if they're explaining the Lorentz force, and they also don't actually show their calculations, they talk about how they're looking at the big picture of the energy and all the things combined, but the friction is going to be propor the proportional to the amount of Lorentz force, and it's going to be limited by the Lorentz force, so to calculate the friction, that the force of friction, they're first going to have to calculate the Lorentz, Lorentz force, which they don't appear to do. Yes, and, and I think the main problem is here that the, the Lorentz force that they calculated is on the center of the cylindrical magnet. But actually, the the Lorentz force is acting on the lower parts of the of the of the battery. So it will close form a close 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 loop like this. So we think that the current will go from here and down to here, and the magnetic field is this direction. This will cause the Lorentz force like this. So, and I think the circular motion is about is because the different diameters of the magnet, which will cause the rotating rotating path. Yes. So uh, simply put, uh, you have two magnets, so you can uh, basically pull this. Uh, Magnet in four, four different combinations. So, uh, can you uh, just uh, quickly say uh, for these uh, four different combinations what the uh, motion will be? Okay, so um, basically, uh, I showed here how when they're in this combination, it's going to cause a force in uh, this direction, uh, out, outwards in, in this field. Um, and so that's when they're both in the same direction. And that it allows them to slide and slide in a circle, or not not slide to actually roll 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 in a circle. Yeah. Uh, but the problem is that if you switch them and if they're 
in, if uh, there's one outwards, one is north, and one outwards, one is south, they're going to be going in opposite directions, and it, it means that they have to, it, this thing would just have to be spinning in a circle, which would probably mean that it would have to take into account the roll, uh, the sliding friction, which would be much higher, and so that's why when it, it probably actually won't even start to spin at all. Uh, so basically, the, the outwards ones have to be the same for it to roll in the big circle. It's aggregation, but I have a small difference. It's, I think that the Lorentz force is acting on the device. If the magnet is has is sucked very, very uh, hard to the battery, the, this becomes a full system. So Lorentz force, because the polarization is different, so the Lorentz force acting on the on the both both on, on both uh, on both sides on the device will cancel out, and this will not cause any movement. Yes. So I wonder if you could take more to your opponent. Yes. So you have, uh, you emphasize, say, uh, this, you think this magnetic force is uh, more important than Lorentz force, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And uh, Lorentz force is related to current here, right? Yeah, well, at least I think, I think they should take it into account. Like, because it's not represented at all in the theory, I think it should at least be recognized. Well, if you uh, just uh, don't put, uh, just put on a food table, not, no aluminum board, do you expect any motion? Uh, if it's just put on the aluminum tail, uh, no, I do not expect any motion because I think that that's just going to, there's not going to be a current. So, and the uh, actual motion is created by, it's related to this current. So, if it's just put on a table that's presumably a, a insulator, it's, then it's, it's not going to have no current. So, it won't force? I, don't, I don't think it will. Move. So, what's the Okay, so let's finish this for this page. Or <laughs> Thank you. 